this won't be the usual intro. You see, a friend of the show is in dire need of help. He and his wife had a beautiful baby girl, Nova, on the 15th, but the poor thing was born with a cleft lip and palate. They were aware of this condition before her birth, but they were of the understanding that insurance would cover it. However, insurance is now denying full compensation due to their family making more than the minimum income for a family of four. That doesn't mean they don't need help. If you can, please go to gofund.me slash 31726BB4 or click the link in the description and consider donating any amount so their baby girl can get the surgeries she needs so she can live the happiest life possible. I've already donated. Thank you to anyone and everyone who has and is considering donating. Now let's get straight into this week's stories, featuring golf course monsters and demonic theaters. These are tales from the break room. Ghosts of Kennedy from Unstable Emily I've done a lot of things during my time on this rock. Some stressful, some thrilling, a few amazing, and some that left me scarred for life. I feel like I'm jinxed, because even the amazing events in my life seem to have a dark undercurrent running through them. Between 2007 and 2019, I worked in and around NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. What happened during those years made my departure from the space scene far easier on me than I would have preferred. You hear a lot of references to the dark side of the moon, but what you don't hear much talk about is the dark side of NASA. And from what I've seen, maybe that's for the best. A lot of bizarre stuff happened out there during those years, like when they found bags of a certain white illegal substance in the building that prepared the space shuttle for launch. Not once, but twice. Apparently, these shuttles weren't the only things getting high out there. Then there was the time one of the lady astronauts drove halfway across the country with pepper spray, a hammer, and some adult diapers, hunting down her romantic rival. But this flavor of weirdness wasn't just confined to Kennedy. Out in Texas at Johnson Space Center, a man shot his supervisor and himself because he thought he was going to lose his job. The end of the shuttle era was a truly strange period in NASA's history. Outside of miscellaneous felonies, there were tragic events that made this pivotal turning point in space exploration history even sadder. In one instance, a custodial worker's body was discovered near a liquid oxygen tank on Pad 39. Launch Complex 39A is where the crew of Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins lifted off for the moon. It's also where the final space shuttle mission, STS-135, lifted off back in 2011. And it was where a troubled man ended his own life by jumping off the launch tower. Cape Canaveral has a long history of supernatural encounters, stretching back thousands of years, long before the Spanish arrived in the 1500s. During my years tromping out to set up equipment and escorting officials to various locations and meetings, I saw some very strange things. As someone who worked around some of the most scientifically advanced technology on the planet, I tried to look for rational explanations for everything. Such was the case when I heard about the ghosts of Launch Complex 34. Back when NASA was a propaganda soldier in the Cold War, the agency raced to beat the Soviets to the moon. The pressure to be the first to put boots on the moon came at a very high cost, including the lives of three astronauts who died during a fire at Launch Complex 34. The site was shut down shortly after the tragedy and abandoned in place. Naturally, after any such event takes place, stories and rumors circulate and grow. I was told about the ghost lights out at 34 when I first arrived, but I never expected to actually see them. I thought the stories were just that, stories. That was until one soggy day when I saw this blue-green orb floating over the marshes. The best way I can describe it was a light 
that was in the shape of a balloon. It was a dull light with a thin trail that reached down toward the ground. It flickered and faded in various shades of blue and green before winking out. Every so often I'd catch one of them flickering out at the periphery of my vision. Not that I know what a supernatural vibe feels like, but I never got one when I saw them. Was it spooky? Yeah. Was it one of the original seven astronauts checking in on us? I don't think so. One thing I'm sure of is it wasn't lightning. Florida is infamous for the storms that rage across the state. I'm very familiar with lightning, and this wasn't it. I can remember all my trips to launch Complex 39A as if they'd happened yesterday. I always saw it as a place of inspiration. It never occurred to me that some people could see it as the exact opposite of inspirational. Times were hard for people living on Florida's space coast during those years. One worker had agreed to take a voluntary layoff, but later changed his mind and tried to keep his job. United Space Alliance, a company comprised of elements of both Lockheed Martin and Boeing, was cutting its staff by half, and he'd already agreed to the layoff. Add in the fact he thought he was going blind, and you get a recipe for tragedy. He'd worked for almost 30 years, sending people into orbit. That was going to come to an end, and he was afraid he was going to be a burden on his family. So on March 14th, 2011, he ended his own life, jumping some 130 feet to his death. In the days that followed, life as sad as it was, continued on. Before long, we started hearing about a guy wandering around 39A. That was a virtual impossibility. Like Boromir said, one does not simply walk into Mordor. Well, one simply does not wander around KSC. You need a kajillion badges and have to go through several gates to get anywhere, and you have to show your ID at each gate, and your badge has numbers on them which let security know which sites you're allowed to access. But the rumors persisted. One day there was a tour being held at LC-39A. I hated most of these tours. They were a bleak reminder of what was coming. There was this guy wandering around, typical pad rat, tan, scrawny, and nerdy, but he seemed friendly enough. Eventually, the tour closes out and we're doing the headcount. We had the right numbers, but one of the faces was missing. I counted again and again, and our numbers were right. As I didn't want to make waves, I left well enough alone, and we headed back. Hey, where's that one guy? A woman I'll call Gail asked. You mean the guy in the USA polo with the glasses? Yeah, where's he? Why wasn't he with the official tour group? Because he wasn't in the official tour group. At first I thought I was going to get into trouble, but then I realized that all my people were present and accounted for. As it turned out, only the group, their guides, and two maintenance personnel were supposed to be on site that day. We've had some pretty awkward situations before. Like when this halfwit snuck out, climbed on top of one of the buildings, and went on to take photos of something he was explicitly told not to. But this wasn't like that. We weren't the only group to see the man strolling around 39A. Every so often, someone would come in grumbling about security and screening not being carried out according to protocol. We knew what that meant. It meant our friend had gone out for a stroll again. I don't know if what we were all seeing was the ghost of that space worker, but I do know that once Atlantis closed the books on the shuttle era, people stopped seeing him. Maybe our math just sucked, and we kept counting the number of people going out wrong. Maybe somehow, some way, someone figured out how to evade security. And maybe, just maybe, a man who toiled for decades to send humans farther and faster wanted to be there when Atlantis touched down for the last time. It chased me out. From Knox Mercer. I used to work at a golf course on the side of a mountain in Canada. It was my first job, and my dad got me to work there since I was 16. He was a member at that course. I enjoyed my time working there, 
and eventually I got used to working the closing shifts. This meant that I was the last employee working for at least three hours, since I had to wait for the last golfers to come off the course, so I could wash their golf carts, drive them into the cart shed to plug them in, then lock up and leave. The course itself has no real closing time. The sun determined when the golfers had to finish up their holes and come back in. Normally, I'd be waiting for the last couple members to come off the course after dark. I would usually text my boss when I got off of work at around 10 to 10.30. This wasn't a hard job by any means, but it was a nice starter job for a teenager. This experience happened while I was just finishing up my second year working at the course. I never went back to work for a third year. It was a night like any other night. However, it was almost the end of the season, and that meant that the course was going to shut down for the winter. I was waiting for the last few golfers to come off the course as the sun was going down. I always liked watching the sunsets there, as bittersweet as they were for me, since the sun going down meant I would be working in the dark until I was able to lock up. Now would be a good time to describe the working environment, the cart shed is where I worked, and it's on the other side of the parking lot, across from the pro shop slash restaurant. When I say shed, I really mean a tarp over a bunch of metal beams holding it up. The tarp was fastened to the ground and beams, so it was like an actual shed. It had a garage, working lights, and a back door that I was able to drive carts around to, so I could load them from the back. The parking lot was only illuminated by two street lamps, and the light coming from inside my cart shed... So, when it got dark, it got very dark. I was about a 20-minute drive away from any actual homes or streetlights. I was waiting for quite some time after dark for the last golfers to come in, as my phone was starting to die. It was 11 at night then. I thought to myself, these guys better not have gotten drunk and lost on the course. I really don't want to go out and look for them. I got up and walked out of the cart shed to check if maybe they quietly came back, leaving their carts in the parking lot. But in the parking lot was my car and their two trucks, so they definitely hadn't come back yet. I walked back into the cart shed. I sat back down in an empty cart to wait for them. I didn't want to use my phone anymore since I didn't want it to die, and I still needed to text my boss when I got off. I sat back and listened to the sounds of the night, waiting to hear the sounds of some golf carts driving back on the rocky path. Then I heard it, the sound of rocks being stepped on to the side of the cart shed that I had to drive on to get to the back door. I swear I was listening to footsteps just beyond the tarp to my right. These were big, slow footsteps, coming up the path towards the front door. I thought it was some sort of animal, since I was in the woods among the mountains. I waited, nervously, following the sound with my eyes as I didn't want to move and make noise. Then suddenly, the steps sounded like they started to run very fast to the back door. Then, all was quiet once more. I looked towards the back door of the cart shed, but I didn't see anything. I sat there for a few more minutes until I heard them again. Big, slow footsteps coming towards the front door where I was. I froze. Then, once I thought they got to the end of the rocky path, they ran back towards the back door. This continued at least three more times. I soon realized they didn't sound like animal footsteps. They sounded too human. You know when a dog walks on gravel, you can hear the four paws of the dog walking. Well, I only heard the sound of two feet walking and running along the rocks. This made me very nervous, but I had to be sure as I had to drive along that path to get the cart in the back as the front was too full. I got up, slowly walking around the shed, and I peeked around it to check out the path. Thankfully, I saw nothing. I calmed down and let my heart rate settle a bit. I thought it might have been my imagination at that point. This was the latest I've ever worked, and I was usually occupied by my phone games that didn't require Wi-Fi. I checked my phone then quickly. 
11.30. I was just about to get in a marshal cart and drive around the dark course. The marshal carts had headlights, and they were faster than the normal carts that regular golfers got. Then, at last, I heard the last two golfers finally coming back. They apparently wanted to finish their entire round, as it would be the last time they'd get to play until next season. They returned their carts, apologized for taking so long, and gave me quite a generous tip. They then packed up and drove off, leaving me all alone to lock up in the middle of nowhere. I washed the cars they rented, then drove them along the side rocky path to the back door to plug them in for the night. I had honestly forgotten about the footsteps I heard before. It wasn't until I closed the back door and front garage door that I heard them again. However, the footsteps were not coming from the side rocky path. They were coming from the back of the cart shed now. The cart shed floor is just a bunch of rocks like the path, so any steps would make the same noise. Whatever was walking around out there must have gone into the back of the cart shed while I was originally sneaking to the side path to see if there was anything there. Thankfully, I didn't have to go back there, but I did still have to set the alarm, turn the lights off, then head out the front door and lock it. It was then I was suddenly hit with this uneasy feeling. You know that feeling you get when your body just wants you to get away? That was the feeling. I quickly grabbed my things, entered my code into the alarm system, and it started to beep. I forgot about how loud that was while it was beeping, giving you time to get out before the alarm was active. As it beeped, those footsteps started to run, very fast, coming in my direction. I wasn't about to wait around and see what was making those steps. I turned out the light, opened the door, and slammed it shut behind me, locking it. I thought that would be the end of it, until something slammed into the now locked door. My legs were shaking so bad it was hard for me to run to my car, but I made it. I got in my car, started it, and drove to the gate. I then stopped my car to get out and lock the gate. I was still shaky from what just happened, but I closed the gate and locked the padlock behind me. It was then that I stopped for a moment. I looked up over at the cart shed. I didn't see anything unusual. However, there was an eerie type of quiet. No breeze, no rustling of leaves in the trees, nothing like that. The only thing I could hear was my car waiting for me. Then I heard the sound that still replays itself in my mind to this very day. The sound of the back door to the cart shed being pushed open against the rocks and a very large exhaling sound. Let your mind do what it will with that description. I knew the alarm would not trigger since it wasn't actually hooked up to the back garage door, only to the front garage and regular door. I got into my car and I drove away so fast I didn't care that I broke speeding laws for a while. I don't know if it was an animal, a man, or maybe some other type of entity that I encountered that day. All I do know is that the large exhaling sound was not normal. It had to have come from something large and strong enough to push a garage door open by force. I ended up texting my boss after midnight to tell him when I locked up and that I only wanted to work the opening shifts if possible. Thankfully, he was able to schedule me for the last few opening shifts of the season and I never had to encounter whatever made that noise again. Restless Entity in the Theater From Victor J. My entire life I've been involved in stage theater, in some capacity or another. My parents were both professors of theater education, so it was a family business, which I was brought into from as early as I can remember. I have a lot of good memories growing up of when I tried my hand as an actor and stage combatant but no matter what I was doing or what theater I was working with, there was always a lingering feeling of eeriness within those walls. The cliche of haunted theaters or ghosts backstage is only as common as it is because of the very real experiences and accounts that stand as its foundation. 
I can personally attest to the validity of these kinds of hauntings from the very theater I work at now. The past four years I've been working backstage as a showrun and rigging technician, and I've compiled all of the experiences I've had in that time with something unknown. I'll be the first to fully admit that your eyes will play tricks on you when working in the dark, but as my accounts go on, I find it harder and harder to explain why. My first memory of something strange happening was during the first show I worked here. I primarily worked on our rigging level, the top floor of the building where we could access our system to rig and fly set pieces and actors from a large opening over the stage. This level has one main entrance, as well as a tucked away back entrance, and there are only three technicians at most up there during the run of a show. All of this to say it's hard to miss if someone enters or leaves. During the day hours, we will have some traffic from other departments who have offices up there. But when a show is going on, there's only us techs up there. We also have a designated closet on this floor where we store our rigging equipment. The rigging room, as we call it, has a motion sensor light set up inside that we have to be very careful and aware of because accidentally turning it on during a show is insanely distracting to the audience when the bright light suddenly turns on. One of my first nights during a show, while myself and my two co-workers were busy moving a set piece on the other side of the floor, the light in the rigging room suddenly flicked on. We rushed over to turn it off, and we were surprised when no one was inside that room. None of us had seen anyone else enter or leave. It just seemingly turned on on its own. We turned the light off and left it at that. But ten minutes later, it happened again. The light came on while we were busy on the other side of the room, and no one had been upstairs with us to trigger it. I casually mentioned to the lead technician at the time it was probably just faulty wiring, but he started shaking his head at me. He'd worked for years before me at this theater and told me that with enough time, I'll begin to notice unexplained things happen. Sure enough, after some time, I did. Granted, with enough time, it became hard to ignore any strange happenings. The longer I worked there, the more intense things became, and I blame that on our lack of a ghost light. For those who may not know, it's theater superstition that you have to leave a single mounted light on stage after a show when everyone is gone for the night. The tradition may have started practically years ago to avoid accidents during midnight hours, but many in the theater industry believe in the importance of leaving a ghost light out to appease any theater spirits so they may leave the productions alone. Our main CEOs and producers, however, are very religious and refused to leave out a ghost light when the concept was brought up. So even though our theater is a nearly brand new building, theater ghosts seem to take up residence quickly and they were not happy that they weren't being catered to. It started small. One time, my coworkers and I were sitting around and talking during the downtime of a show. Out of nowhere, a stack of plastic cups by a water jug up and flew across the room as if someone had thrown them. We checked for any wayward gusts of AC, but we found nothing, and the second we stacked them all again, they were flung across the room almost immediately. We don't have cups up here anymore because of this, after about a year, I was promoted to full-time, and as a result, I had to stay after shows sometimes to help with repairs and touch-ups. I always hated this, because I would usually be one of the last people in the building, and yet I would always feel uneasy, like I was being watched while I worked. During one of our shows, there was a telegraph as part of a set piece that was flown in, Late at night when I stayed after the show to do some maintenance on props, the telegraph started tapping. The piece was not electric. It wasn't even wired to tap on its own. Instead, it only moved when it was actively being pushed by an actor. I don't know Morse code, so I'm not sure if the tapping was anything coherent. But regardless, I left very quickly afterward. A co-worker told me a similar story 
about a prop phone that would ring without being plugged into anything. I asked if he ever picked it up, and he told me he'd rather die than attempt that. All of this activity started costing the theater a lot as it continued. We have a headset and comm system that we use to make show calls and talk across the building, and people started to hear things in the static. On more than one occasion, I heard my own name said when everyone else had left and I was still on the headset. It was a voice I didn't recognize either. Victor, Victor look, up, look up, was the most common one I heard. The first time I heard it, I thought it was a prank. I looked up, but nothing was there. And when I checked out at the PA desk, I was told that I was the last person in the building for the last half hour. Some of my friends and coworkers reported that they heard their names too when they were alone, and a few even said they heard screaming and threats. Our sound team blamed the comm system for being old, picking up things on other channels, but even after buying an entire new comm system and headsets, the voices continued. Only this time it was clearer to hear, since there wasn't as much static in the background. We replaced our security system a few times too, the camera in particular. Tools and sets will be moved around from day to day when no one is in the building, and every time they did, our backstage cameras would fritz out. Our camera monitors pointed on stage worked fine, but anything elsewhere would black out, often in the night. One day we came in to find every chair in the building, even from the upper floors, stacked in a pile in the pit under the stage. Our facilities manager blamed it on a nebulous group of kids breaking in to mess with us, and several times he had our cameras updated or switched to try and catch them in the act. But even those new cameras continued to have the same problems. A night watch position was even hired to guard entrances, but things would continue to move in the rooms they weren't in. And of course, no group of teens were ever caught coming near the building. Eventually, the higher-ups gave up, and we were just told to come into work early every day to put anything that moved back into place before starting. After about two years of me working there, things ramped up. There was a night, after everyone else had cleared out, that me and a co-worker were staying late to calibrate a light on stage level. While both of us were on stage, we heard a noise up on the catwalk above us. Our catwalk is made up of metal grating, and it sounded like someone wearing heavy boots was running up and down the walkways at a full sprint. Because of the grating, however, both of us could see through the catwalk and saw no one there. After the noise abruptly stopped, there was a laugh that began low and built up to almost a shriek from the same location. Myself and my coworker decided to calibrate the light during the day before the show tomorrow. A few nights after the running in the catwalk, while I was in a rigging harness during a show to set up one of our flying set pieces, I felt something tug at one of the ends of a strap around my leg. I was standing in an open area of our rigging level, riding on a checklist. This was a gentle tug at first, two times. Then before I could do anything, the strap pulled hard and quick. The force of it pulled me to one side, and the strap around my leg tightened so hard it started to cut off my blood circulation. Neither me nor my coworkers could loosen it by hand. Someone had to run to grab a harness key in order to relieve the pressure. Now, things reached a fever pitch when we started to see them. I saw two, and most of my coworkers had their own sightings. The first one I saw was during the after show hours. It was only me and the PA who doubled as security at the desk behind the stage door to the building. I'd finished the repairs asked of me, and I was checking out with the PA for the night. Behind the PA desk is a TV set up to live broadcast the onstage camera monitors. This is usually for run of show purposes so people can see what's happening at that specific point of the show. The camera itself is pointed on stage, but in order to account for the height of some set pieces, it's zoomed out enough that the first few rows of the audience are seen. That night, as I was checking out, I saw a figure standing in the audience. The feed was grainy enough that I couldn't make out any features, 
besides long hair and a gray top. The figure was facing away from the camera, swaying from side to side, its arms by its sides. I pointed it out to the PA, who told me everyone else had checked out for the night. Thinking it might be a patron who had snuck past the front of house staff, the PA and I walked the entire building. All the doors and windows were locked, and there wasn't a person to be found. Granted, there are some areas we didn't check, but neither of us wanted to climb into the pit of the mannequin-riddled storage room to look. After making our rounds, we went back to the PA desk and looked at the TV. The figure had moved, this time standing and swaying center stage, now facing the camera. We decided to just leave and lock up. According to the facilities manager, nothing triggered the alarms that night. My personal final straw was when I was making my way down from the top floor to the PA desk at the end of the night. In order to move from level to level, I had to travel down a massive concrete stairwell. I was moving downstairs when I heard the laugh from the catwalk again. It echoed softly, the sound bouncing all around me in the stairwell. I hadn't heard anyone else with me before this, since footsteps carry loudly. So I leaned over the railing to see if I could see anyone on the stairs in the other levels. Seeing all the way down to the darkened stair entrance to the pit, I saw a face leaning over the railing, smiling up at me. Honestly, I get chills writing about it now. It had these big, unblinking eyes and a toothy smile that stretched farther than is natural. It had the same color hair as the figure from the PA TV. It opened its mouth, mid-smile, and laughed the same shrieking laugh I heard before. Quickly, I pulled myself back from leaning over the railing and immediately took the nearest exit out of the stairwell, regardless of what floor it spat me out at. I called the PA, and I refused to move until they came up to me and walked me down and out of the building. After that, I called my supervisor, and I took out all my PTO, which at the time was about two weeks. During my break from work, a coworker told me that one of the producers saw something in their office, the specifics of which I still haven't been told. But now we were told to set out a ghost light every night. When asked about why, the producer told us that since we were doing a historical fiction play at the time, it was out of respect for the victims of that event. But even after we closed that show, we were told to continue setting out the ghost light. Since then, neither myself nor my coworkers have really noticed anything. One friend swears one of the mannequins in storage moved its head towards him while he was down there, but we don't put much stock in it. It's even felt better to work, with a noticeable difference in feeling. I don't feel like I'm being watched anymore, and I don't dread getting on the headset anymore. Reflecting on these last four years, I can only say that regardless of your thoughts or feelings on the paranormal, some superstitions are put in place for a reason. Listen to them. Someone in my tent. From Anonymous. I don't think I'll ever feel safe sleeping in the woods again, even around other people. To provide some background, I was a 21-year-old female at the time. A couple of summers ago, I decided to work as a leader for some rock climbing trips my college was organizing. We took climbing very seriously, unafraid to venture into some remote areas. This particular group was larger than usual, comprised of both guys and girls. I felt comfortable and at ease in the middle of nowhere. The trip I led was in Kentucky, and it was off to a great start. The weather was perfect, and we all were climbing quite well. On the third night of the trip, however, my perspective was changed forever. Even though it's been two years since, I still remember every detail as vividly as the night it occurred. I was sound asleep in a tent with my three other female friends, when suddenly I awoke in the middle of the night. I was really sweaty, and I soon figured out why. One of my friends had managed to move around enough in her sleep that she was now completely draped over me. 
as I reached down to push her off. My body froze, in every sense of the word. I was paralyzed, my blood running ice cold through me. This person draped over me was not my friend, nor anyone I knew. It was a complete stranger, a grown man, sound asleep, draped over my body. I was in complete shock. My brain couldn't process what was happening. I looked at my friend, willing her to wake up, but she, like the other girls in my tent, was sound asleep. I don't know how I managed to move my arm, but I slowly reached out and grabbed one of my actual friends, squeezing and pushing until she finally opened her eyes. When she saw the fear in my eyes, she shot up, soon realizing the situation. I could see the terror on her face, and she started to cry. We have to get out, she mouthed to me. I nodded, tears welling up in my own eyes. I had to overpower every single thought in my brain, begging me not to move, not to wake this person up. But I had to get him off of me. I was shaking so hard I could barely use my hands. I started to wiggle my way out from under him, but to my complete horror, he moved and started to wake up. He pushed me back down, and I could hear my friend cry. I don't know what this man wanted, but I was not going to die in this tent. I wasn't going to let my friends die in this tent. In one quick motion, I shoved this man off of me as hard as I could, and I grabbed my awake friend, huddling against the wall of the tent. I panicked to the point I could barely breathe, my legs feeling like rubber. Summoning my voice from somewhere deep within, I said to him, Get out of our tent now! My voice shook with each word. Lie back down. Now. He responded with a deep voice. My stomach twisted into knots. I could not believe what was happening, and I couldn't take it any longer. I took my friend by her arm and lunged across the tent towards the door, clawing the zipper open. I stumbled out and screamed as loudly as I could, shaking the guy's tents. Keeping an eye on the dark door of the tent, I prayed I wouldn't see a dark figure darting out after me. Thankfully, the guys got up right away. I could barely speak through my tears. There's a man in our tent. He was lying on me, I managed to say. The guys ran over to our tent and literally dragged the person out. By now, the other girls had woken up in the tent and were shrieking. I felt horrible for leaving them in there, but I didn't know what else to do. What were you doing in there? One of the guys yelled at the man, who I just now realized wasn't a man, but a woman with a very deep voice. Through her drunken slur, we learned that she had drank too much that night and stumbled into our campsite thinking it was hers. She got into our tent and thought my friends and I were her kids. That's why she yelled at us to lie back down. She thought we were her children trying to sneak out. She brushed off the whole thing as a hilarious drunken incident and managed a nonchalant apology. The other girls and I were so shaken up that we couldn't think straight. We spent the rest of the night in the guy's tent. The horror of waking up in the middle of the night to a complete stranger basically cuddling with you is beyond fathomable. The fact she managed to unzip our tent and climb in without anyone noticing makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I thank God every day it wasn't someone with darker intentions. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here now. Night Watch from Boink W98 I worked as a security guard, and the night in question I had duty. Now let me tell you, Staying awake by yourself for 24 hours straight can be tiring. Even though I just sat in one room, roaming around the building every hour or so. It wasn't too bad. Pretty easy work. I had this huge flashlight too, which I shined underneath the desk and made like puppet shows with. You know, whenever I was bored. That was probably the most entertaining thing that was going to happen that night. Or so I thought. It was about one in the morning 
and my long shift would end at 7.15 a.m. That is, if my relief came in when he was supposed to. I was about to go make more rounds. Now the lights in the building were automatic, and they were just bright enough that I could see where I was walking. The building was an old apartment complex. No one lived there anymore. But it was one of those deals where they still had security there, because local kids like to sneak inside for some reason. But other than the automatic lights, it was pretty much pitch black, besides some street lights not too far from the building itself. So I got up, grabbed my security book, and headed out to take a stroll around, closing and locking the door behind me. There were three floors to that building. My office was on the ground floor. I got about halfway through to the second floor when the lights gave a flicker, as if they were about to go out. I figured it was nothing, but halfway up the stairs towards the third floor, the lights actually did go out. It must have been a fuse or something, I told myself, but I couldn't be sure. That building was quite old. I skipped the third floor, making my way back down to the office, fumbling around in the dark with my keys. I managed to unlock the door, grabbing the flashlight I'd left behind and heading back out. I went over and fiddled around with the fuse box, flicking endless buttons, but no luck. The lights around the building were out for the night, it seemed. I made my way back to the office. I had a seat and played on my phone when I heard what sounded like someone walking above me on an upper level, probably some animals, so I brushed it off. It continued and sounded as if the footsteps got quieter and quieter, as if someone or something were walking away from my direction. Nothing happened for a while after that. Before long, it was about time for me to take another lap around. I grabbed the flashlight in the desk this time and headed out. Walking around, I heard what sounded like a door closing very slowly. Not like the creak of an old wooden door, more like a metal-on-metal metal sound like the scrape and clunk of a modern door. The building was one of those apartments where right outside the room there would be a balcony to walk around on, looping around the whole building. I brushed it off and kept walking, shining my flashlight into the trees and bushes, making sure there were no animals or children trying to get in. I heard a couple of scurrying sounds like that of a raccoon or rabbit. As I shined my light, I noticed something near a tree I quickly aimed my light right at the tree, but whatever it was, I guess it was gone, because I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. But what I saw before, I swear it looked like a person hunching down behind a tree, sort of squatting. I couldn't be sure. It was getting late, and maybe my mind was playing tricks on me. I forgot about the third deck, figuring if someone was up there, then I would have heard them. I went back to the office. After about 45 minutes, I heard these same exact footsteps, but as they got farther and farther, they also grew faster, as if someone or something was running. By now, it was starting to creep me out. I tried to ignore it, but that spine-tingling thought of what it was, that maybe it wasn't an animal, kept coming to my mind. There was one door to my office and right next to my desk, there was a big window with blinds that were almost all the way down, but stopped and left about two inches of open window. So I could just barely see outside without someone seeing me in there. But all I could see at that moment was a distant streetlight with a bench. There was a man out there who seemed to be wearing loose clothing, cupping his hands towards his mouth as if he was trying to stay warm. He was facing away from me. He was also bouncing around and pacing. It was a chilly night. But what was weird was that when he faced towards the building I was in, he stopped. He then kind of bent over at the waist, as if he saw me and was trying to get a better look. Then he stood up again, keeping his hands up at his face. He took a slow step towards my building. After that, he stopped, turned around, and quickly walked away in the opposite direction, out from underneath the streetlight and into the darkness. That creeped the heck out of me, but I figured it was one thing I didn't have to worry about anymore. At least I hoped that was the case. That was when those footsteps came again, 
soon speeding up once more. That's when I realized the way the steps sounded kind of reminded me of how that man was moving under the light. I was definitely freaked out. The remainder of the shift was going to be a long one. If I didn't clear all this up, find a way to explain it. I grabbed my flashlight, stepping right outside the door and shining it left and right down the hallway leading out towards the woods. Nothing. I then cautiously made my way around the first floor, and on the way up to the second, my heart stopped. I could hear those footsteps. For the first time, I wasn't in the office when I heard them. I was out there, out here, with whatever had been walking around. There they went, slowly, sounding as if they were right above me, on the third floor. I still hadn't yet been to the third floor. Every time I was about to walk up there, something distracted me, and I just got sidetracked. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me from the third floor, as if they were leaning over the railing, staring right down at me. I shone my light quickly up to the third floor where the steps ended, and nothing. Some relief for a moment. I went on to the second floor, constantly checking behind me as I walked around, paranoid like a kid that ran up the steps after turning their basement lights off. I made my way back around the building to where I could see that streetlight again. And there it was, a silhouette of a man. He appeared to be squatting down and hunched over this time. No pacing, no bouncing. He was watching me. It was cold out, but that's not why I got chills. This time, when he dashed back out of the light, he stopped. I could just barely make out what he was doing, but he appeared to have turned around crouched down towards me and just stayed there, watching me. I could feel it. This extreme discomfort grew upon me. I couldn't take more than three steps without having to check behind me. I just stopped my tour on the third floor after seeing the man, and I went back to the office, this time locking the door behind me. I couldn't do this. That person wasn't even here, but I could see him from the office window. Suddenly, those footsteps I'd heard above me were now growing louder with each step. It was as if they were coming towards me. I swallowed so loud you could have heard it from down the road. Down the stairs, the loud footsteps clapped on concrete steps, coming down to my level. The door to my office had a big window right in the middle of it. I wanted to turn out the lights so that whatever it was that was making the noise didn't know where I was. I quickly sprang up out of my chair, but inches away from the switch, the light went out by itself. I was shaking then. My fingers began to twitch. I felt around the office for the flashlight, but I couldn't find it. I don't think it was there. I must have dropped it somewhere. I peeked over at the strange man through the bottom of the window blinds. He was still there, back in the light now, standing straight up. I couldn't tell if he was facing me. I sat back down, my back against the wall, shaking out of my boots. Suddenly, I saw the silhouette of a person standing in front of the window of the door, just off to the side. I couldn't make out any features. Hopefully, whoever that was couldn't see me. The man at the light was now bent over again. I glanced back over at the door, and the figure was gone but I heard it. I could hear it walking outside. I heard shuffling, then it stopped. Dead silence. For now, at least, no more than about ten minutes later, I heard what sounded like a laugh in a deep voice just outside. I saw my flashlight shining towards the outside of the office door. My heart dropped. I must have dropped it outside earlier when I got freaked out looking at the man in the street. Someone grabbed it and was now using it. There was definitely someone out there. I began to see shapes in the light. Finger puppets. Just like what I would do to pass the time. Why are they doing this? I said to myself in a whisper. As soon as I finished the question, the silhouettes of rabbits were gone. But the flashlight remained on. I peered over to the street and that man was gone too. I waited for a few moments, 
before eventually unlocking the door and stepping outside. No one was there, but my flashlight lay on the ground, the beam reaching out to me. Someone had just left it there. I went to grab it, but it felt slick and slipped out of my hands. I firmly picked it back up to get a look at what was on my hands. They were red. It looked like blood. I gasped and I backed away. I turned and reached for the office doorknob, but now it was locked. I hadn't done that, I was sure of it. I turned and at the end of the hallway, just out of the corner of the light, just barely enough to see anything, I saw something I wish I never had. It was the man from the street. He was standing there facing me, bent over at the waist. I could just make out what he looked like. He wore what appeared to be old dress clothes, brown stained and worn, a half-buttoned white shirt. His mouth appeared to be slightly open, bright, his eyes were bright white and glazed over. He was staring right at me. He appeared to be middle-aged. He then straightened up and began to walk towards me. As I started to turn around and run away down the hall, I heard him start running. He was mumbling something now. I couldn't understand what it was. I turned the corner and without one thought, I sprinted up the stairs, running along the second floor. I heard him coming up towards me right up to the third level when I saw what appeared to be a child, a little boy. He had very old styled dress clothing and a bowl cut. He turned back to look at me and he acted as if I had scared him. He just took off away from me. But it wasn't me that had scared him apparently. When I turned around, I was so startled I fell backwards, trying to scoot myself away from the man that was chasing me. Because now as he ran, he was bent over with arms hanging in front of him. He slowed to a walk and approached me slowly. I didn't know what to do. My first thought was to run back into the office, so I sprang to my feet and began to make my way down there, leaving the man behind me. Before I entered the office, I grabbed the flashlight off the ground. I then went inside, slamming the door shut behind me and locking it. I shined the light right in front of me and nearly screamed. There the man was, in the office, right in front of me, bent down his face inches away from mine. He began to mumble something as he reached towards me. He grabbed onto me and opened his mouth. That's when all the lights in the building turned back on, and the moment they did, that man was gone. The security guard, relieving me for the night, my friend Jason, knocked on then opened the door I was sitting against, which I swear I just locked. He peered inside to see what was blocking the door and looked at me. Uh, Mike? Why were you on the floor? He asked as I stood up. I couldn't force the words out. The blood on my hands was gone too. Everything was just normal again, as if none of it had happened. I grabbed my keys and left without saying a word. I went home and I found out there was a crazy old man who used to live in those apartments specifically room 325 on the third level. I also found out he murdered a little boy there years before. The whole story was far too unsettling for me to keep reading. I quit that job, and about a month later, I got a text. It was from an unknown number. All the text read was, New job? I didn't reply, thinking it was spam or a wrong number. I was driving home one day when I stopped at a red light. I looked left and right, and I saw down at the end of that long road, a bus stop, and one man there, bent over at the waist, slowly waving. Warning. The following story contains mentions of harm against children. Friends, scary work experiences. From Cricket Girl 20. These two stories come from my friends, Bella and Garrison. The first is from Bella. She called me one night and asked if I could pick her up from work. I told her yes, and I noticed she sounded shaken. Once I picked her up, I asked, Bella, is everything okay? 
what she told me would have been scary for any young woman. She then explained, An hour before I called you, I was just passing the time looking at my phone when a man walked up to the window of the snow cone stand. He asked for a large snow cone. Of course, I made it, and as I opened the window to take his payment, he grabbed me by the arm and said, Give me the money. I froze then. I told him I don't have the key to the safe, which was a lie. He got angry and started banging on the side of the building. The clerk in the gas station across the way called the police after seeing what happened. He then came running over with his baseball bat and held the man at bay until the police arrived. It was terrifying. I felt like crying. After she told me this, I offered to let her sleep on my couch that night so she didn't have to go home. The next short story comes from Garrison. Garrison worked as a security guard. He has loads of scary stories, but these two always stand out. The first story happened on his second week as a security guard. He was patrolling an apartment complex in Oklahoma City when he saw a man wandering around. So he asked, Can I help you? The man replied, I'm just looking for someone. After he said that, he instantly reached for Garrison's taser. Garrison was able to push him back and pull his taser, saying, Don't move. He called the cops and they took the man away. His second story took place when he was a security guard for a homeless shelter. One night, he was sitting in his booth when a couple came up with a German shepherd. The lady asked, Could we get in for tonight? Garrison knew he wasn't allowed to let people in without asking the shelter boss. But as it was midnight, and he felt bad for the dog, he let them in anyway. He said he didn't have a good feeling about the man, but he let it go. The following day, he got a call from the boss of the shelter, and what he heard validated his bad feelings. His boss told him, Garrison, the couple you let in last night, the man specifically, he was a registered well, child offender, if you know what I mean. And what he did after you let him in, let's just say he victimized a little girl and was caught early this morning. Garrison said when he heard that, he wanted to puke. His boss then told him that he couldn't work at the shelter anymore. He couldn't stop blaming himself for what happened to that girl. Garrison changed after that too. Whenever I see him, I know he still thinks about it. Ice Delivery From Brandon C. I'm a 28-year-old male. This story happened two years ago. I was working for an ice delivery company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I drove their Class B CDL box trucks to stores and gas stations that had our ice boxes installed, loaded them with ice, and had someone from the store sign the invoice on a tablet. One Saturday afternoon, I had a delivery on my route that took me to a convenience store in a particularly sketchy area. I parked against the curb outside the store, loaded my six-foot-tall dolly with bags of ice, and entered. I asked the clerk where the ice box was. He showed me it was in a separate room in the far back of the store. I didn't think anything of it, and I went straight to unloading my dolly. Everything was quiet. I figured it was just a slow afternoon for the store. It was just a curbside convenience store, after all. I remember noticing that they were still selling video games for the original Xbox, sitting on a turnstile near the register. When I got back to the front of the store, I learned why it was so quiet. The store manager was standing in front of the door and locking it shut. Two or three customers were standing around him, all staring out the glass of the door. I asked what was going on. One of the customers looked at me confused, asking how I didn't hear anything. I asked what she was talking about. She explained two people had fired off ten shots at each other just outside the store and took off running. I stayed in that store for a few more minutes, hiding behind my dolly, thinking it would protect me. I wanted to call someone to tell them what happened, but I'd left my phone in the truck since I was using it as a GPS. I waited until a police car showed up before I finally exited the store and made a dash to my truck. 
Four police cars showed up, blocking each section of the four-way intersection the store was cornered on. I ran along the passenger side of the truck, which was facing the buildings. I figured that would shield me from any potential gunfire that might happen. I grabbed my phone and ran back into the store. I called my manager then, explaining everything. But he told me to just keep doing the delivery like normal. Furious, I told him I'm not doing that. I'm getting out of there for my safety. I loaded the dolly back into my truck, found the next stop that was as far from that area as possible, and delivered there before driving back to the shop and clocking out for the day. I didn't even have the corner store owner sign an invoice. I didn't care. I've got a young daughter, and I wanted to go hug and tell her how much I love her. I quit that job a few weeks later, because I got badly injured at a routine stop. I let my managers know I would never be delivering to that corner store again. That day, I learned two things. First, if your boss tells you to keep working in a place or in a way that it can put your safety or life in danger, quit. No paycheck is worth your life. Second, always listen to your gut. There is likely a good reason you don't feel comfortable going somewhere or doing something. It might just save your life. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com.